Hi everyone, hope you're getting ready to enjoy another beautiful summer weekend. Um, to introduce myself, I'm Lindsay Partridge, Marketing Coordinator here at Agency Access. I'd like to welcome you to our sixth installment of our Google Hangouts. Today's topic is the top 10 most frequently asked questions about estimating. Joining us today is creative consultant and head of estimating, Lynn Kyle, along with founder and CEO of The Photo Closer, Frank Mayo, and to round us out, creative consultant and photo agent, Stephanie Menuez. So let's jump in and get started. Um, the first question to start us off today is, what information do you need to start an estimate, and what if the client does not have all the details regarding their creative approach? You know what, I'll, I'll take that one. First of all, thanks uh, to Agency Access for doing this. I think it's really important, and um, I'm glad to be a part of uh, a group with um, Stephanie and, uh, and Lynn. You know, for me, when uh, you know, going into doing an estimate, it's, it's, get, it's getting all that information, and sometimes it is true um, the client won't have, the art buyer or the art director may not have all the information. So what, what I tend to do as it relates to, to the estimating process is really look at it as almost a first date. And I just want to get to know the person. And if, I, if I've worked with the art buyer before, that's one thing. If not, it's more about getting the information. If they don't have the information and they still need the estimate, what I'll try to do is I will try to get as much as I can and then say to them, so for instance, if we're doing portraits and they're not sure if they're going to be in the studio or be in an environment, but what I'll tell them, you know what, if you'd like, I can do two estimates for you. I'll do one in the studio and one as if we're on location, and I'll, I'll make it very general, but I'll say to them, you know, once you give me all the final specs, I will then tighten up the estimate one way or the other. But what I want to try to do is be very accommodating to them, recognizing they don't have all the, their information, which isn't the art buyer's fault. That's just how this situation you know, manifested itself. But what I want to do is I want them to know that I'm really in it to help them and to be a resource. So I try to be accommodating and just leave the door open that you know, once you have all the information, you know, we'll get back to you, and you know, then I can tighten up that estimate. That's how I like to try to start it. That's great. No, and I agree. It's just, you know, it's it's getting in there and starting to collaborate with them and being a team member is so important. So that's what we, you know, you always try to want to keep that conversation going as well. Yeah, it's like a discovery. Um, that's great, the accommodating part, Frank. I agree. And, you know, it's like a discovery. Sometimes, they, like you said, it's not always the art producer's fault. They may not have the information, and so you're as friendly and and supportive as you can be on their team to, to solve their problem and make this project great. And and sometimes they discover, oh, I didn't realize that. Let me ask the client. I'll get back to you. And, you know, so it's it's our job to really suss that out. Yeah, and, and, and while we're doing that, it's really, it's really they're getting the idea that that person is easy to work with. They're not difficult. They want to help. And remember, they came to you in the first place because they liked your style of photography. So, you know, as the photographer, you should be, you know, feel really good about that, that piece of it. And now, you know, how do I, how do I engage and move on? That's really, that's really the, that first call or that first um, conversation is, is key. Absolutely. Well, and I just want to add, too, is with that is, like you mentioned, Frank is providing maybe two different estimates. So when you do, just make sure that those details, if you're assuming some things, like they don't have an idea of where they want this location and you're saying okay well let's go ahead and just bid a local park you know make sure that that's really clear in the description and maybe even in the email as well is just to um, that it's a good starting point for them it'll help them to kind of wrap their head around these projects but you want to make sure all those details are in that initial estimate because likely with those it's going to keep evolving and there's going to be you know quite a few revisions Mm -hmm. Right, and, and what you're doing is you're sort of helping them internally. All right, we have an estimate, and one is for a park, and one is for a bakery, and, you know, one is, um, you know, who knows where the other one is. It's just, you know, you're sort of narrowing this down, and, and the art buyer is getting a sense, wow, this, you know, this woman, this guy is really easy to work with. They're, they're, moving, they're moving us along, and so when you get off the phone with them, and that you're sending the estimate or, or, or you're waiting, they're remembering 
you know what? Working with Stephanie is really nice. She's easy, she's smart, and she knows what she's doing. That's really because if you if you put your um, you put yourself in the shoes of that art buyer, she's working with half a dozen projects. Yeah. And when she comes back to this one, she's going to remember, you know what, working with Lynn, Lynn had a lot of good questions, Lynn was easy to work with, so it, it now it sort of makes it easier for her, the art buyer, as she's going through the queue of all these estimates and saying, you know what, I'm really busy and I know that Stephanie gets it, so she's going to start naturally just gravitating to the art to the rep or the photographer who's easy to work with. You know, it, it's just human nature. Yeah, it's a comfort level. It puts them at ease. You just want to get, you know, keep the call like you're gathering that first info. You want to keep the call, you know, light, upbeat, positive, supportive, but also quick and kind of sense if it's not a good time for them to talk. And some of the basics that I, you know, sometimes I help. I am a freelance uh, agent right now, helping different photographers and agents with estimates acting as the agent, so sometimes we don't get the proper specs from the art producers. We don't get everything we need, like Frank was saying, all the info, all the specs, which are, you know, who is the client, um, you know, what piece of business is that for them, They're, you know, all those good questions about budget and where are we shooting, how many talent, or is it studio location, like Frank said, and all these things, sometimes they don't even know the answers, but that's awesome that you can provide two estimates, give them options, you know, you're, you're trying to get as clear as you can, otherwise, you know, your producer and your photographer, all these little details can't be priced out, it's just basic. And if you make, and if you make them notice, to, um, to Lynn's point, this is very much a preliminary estimate. It's, it's just really to get us started, Here, here's a framework, and in the categories that they don't have the answers, you just have to be decided, to be decided. So you, you're really just starting to, to build this at, to build this estimate in such a way that they recognize that they can't show that to a client just yet or to a, a creative director because they need those answers, those questions answered. So you're sort of helping them move it along the tracks. So, you know, very much to Lynn's point of stating it. This is a preliminary estimate. This is mm -hmm. waiting for details, you know, those kinds of things. To be determined on items we simply don't know, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, great points, everyone. So, Lynn, what is your typical response when a client, a client asks for a day rate? Well, and unfortunately, this happens more than we realize, is they just want to have sort of a quick answer, but there is no quick answer. Um, again, as like what we were talking about is keeping that conversation going on. So you you don't want to say you know I don't have a day rate because um, really it's going to be based on per project. So it's you know it involves the complexity of the shoot, the usage that they want, and a lot of times when they're just saying you know what is your day rate, they haven't given you given you any details. So you just have to again be kind of you know go in and and be a collaborator with them. What details do you have? Let's put together a formal estimate. And I always think it's even important if they're if they're just trying to get a, a feel for something. Um, they're just like, well, what would this cost or this cost? I still think it's really important to put it into a formal estimate because then that gives you that base, you know. And sometimes I find actually it it actually gets the momentum going quicker. Um, because you provide a you know a thorough estimate, maybe you're assuming some things, but um, you know, as Frank mentioned, they'll start respecting that you're really thorough, really smart about it, and um, starting off on a good foot. So you don't what you want to avoid that question and just ask for more you know more details on the project. Yeah, and and, and I think sometimes. And that's sort of the frustrating part for photographers is sometimes they're just fishing, right? They're just trying to get an idea, and you know you you want to be you know you want to be accommodating, but on the other hand, you you don't want to labor labor over it so much in that you know well I I can't really tell you what this or you know those types of things. You, you I I like to say you know if somebody says to me you know what is Michael's day rate? Well I'll say you know just give me a general idea you know. Is it, you know, two still life shots, and you know they're on seamless. You know that 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 you know we're we'll going to shoot that in the day, and that could be anywhere between here and here. Now, if 
they don't give you more information around that and you never hear from them again. Because that happens too, right? They just come in and fishing for a price. That's frustrating. That's a, you know, a shitty part of the business. But, you know, it's, 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 it's a difficult thing and you shouldn't get, as a photographer, frustrated by it. Because at least out of this, you've gotten some type of a contact with either an art director or an art buyer. So if you've given them a price, right, whatever that, whatever that number is, and you never hear from them again, that isn't because your number was too high. That isn't because your number was too low. It was just they were fishing. You know, and you, and you can't labor over, oh, I did that wrong, or that was a mistake. It's more, it's more about them, and, you know, you can follow up, and sometimes that, you know, it just goes away. I mean, that's how crazy the business is sometimes. But, you know, had you, you, that you gave them a number, I don't know that it's a bad thing, but certainly if it's based on something, if it's based on, all right, we're doing two still live shots on white, and here's, you know, here's generally what's involved, I don't, I don't have a real issue with just giving them a number and saying, you know, I'll get back to you with an estimate, or when are you going to get back to me with more details, or who is the art director. If I can get something out of them, then I feel it's, it's a success, but again, you don't know on the back end if this is really going to work out. That's just one of those pieces of our business that, you know, isn't always the right way. I'm sorry. But sometimes you're caught in that trap. Yeah. And I, I agree, and, and um, to, to Lynn, what Lynn said as well, to add to that, um, kind of trying to avoid it a little, but in a nice supportive way, you can just say, you know, this if it's a particular photographer I'm, I'm helping on an estimate, depending on them, um, and usually nine out of ten times, you could say, you know, this photographer, or I am as the photographer, I'm flexible with rates, and, and I'd like to know more about the project, you know, in terms of your usage parameters and the client, etc. And then you can say, like Frank said, you know, it's between here and here. And if you have a really good sense, get some good advice um, so that you're not way too low and you're not way too high, but you give them a good range. And then you say, I can let me get back to you on that. I'll let me take a look at the whole big picture and I'll get back to you. But for sure, we're flexible. We want to make this happen when I know more about your budget. See, and that, and that really is a great point about being flexible and saying it. But I, I think there's another piece to this. When you're on the phone with them, before you even start to get into this, if you have the luxury that someone's calling you from this ad agency, what I like to do is to go to that agency's website so I know a couple of their clients before we, before we even have that conversation. And I'd like to say to them, I said, listen, you know, I'm going to be flexible. You know, I really want to work with you guys. I know that you have this account and this account and this account. So I want to work with you on this project, but my interest is to work on a number of your accounts because you're really a terrific ad agency. And I know you do this work, and I know you do that work. That way, you're laying your cards on the table. You're saying, I know this business. I am in this business. So all of a sudden, you're putting that person you know, in a, in a place where they have to respect you because you've now said you know about their business and you know about the work that they produce and you've already said, you know, I know you guys have Nike and I know you have Purina. I really want to work on those pieces of business. So from my standpoint, if this is a way for me to get into the agency, I'm all in. You know, I'll negotiate with you with my, um, with my fee. All I'd ask you guys to do is look at my portfolio, look at my website. You know, something like that where you can gain something out of it as yeah. you're starting to build that relationship. Having that knowledge and it gives you leverage. Yep. Great. Okay, Stephanie, can you, um, for us and our viewers, explain what a buyout is and you know what photographers should do if you know a client asks for one? Yeah, um, we don't like the term buyout in my uh, world of photo agent experience. Um, because it implies transfer of copyright, that's how I was always looking at it, but we, uh, I always encourage people never ever to transfer copyright on principle, you, you know, and, and it isn't a bad idea to copyright your bodies of work, entire bodies of work, single images, whole portfolios with the Library of Congress, it's a great idea and it's not that expensive, just get into that system and then you're even more protected in terms of copyright and there's plenty of great websites and experts that can talk to that and I'm constantly refreshing and reviewing on that point. Buyout is a serious thing 
And so I try to just change the language in agreement with them if that's what they absolutely need. First, I try for five years, one year, two years, and then within the buyout, I say, okay, this is what they really want. It's a car account. It's a specific kind of account. There's no way around it. We've tried, you know, the art, the art producer's experience. They also understand the, the implications of a buyout, but which used to cost a lot of money. More and more people are asking for that, but I term it, I, I, I call it unlimited use, unlimited time. So use and time unlimited. And then territory is very important to ask where. So within it, instead of calling it buyout, I say, okay, we're, we're looking at unlimited use, unlimited time, but for what? You can limit that within the unlimited use, unlimited time. So they say, well, actually, we're only going to need it in these three states, and we only need um, out of home, and we're doing a whole social media campaign, and we, we really only need it for these three magazines. So you can say, okay, unlimited use, unlimited time for those specific items. That way, it's easier to approach the creative fee once you know more about the budget because, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, unlimited use and limited time is very broad usage and, and it should cost a lot because if they were really doing in a huge media buy, they would have a huge budget. And oftentimes they're just asking for that uh, because the client thinks they don't ever want to have to come back and negotiate more. They don't ever want to have to go back and ask the talent for more usage. Well, you know, that's just, it's just trying to guide them to, to limit it to a point where they're still happy with what you can give them for that budget. But, you know, if you can't get it down to five years or more realistically, then at least we try to find out what exactly do they need it for? What are their needs? Right. And I find that, I find buyout, it's just a, such an ambiguous term. And like you said, you have to further explore what exactly do they want. Are they just speaking? Are they speaking of all the images? You know, are they speaking of a few images? It, it you know, you'd never want to use that term on any of your paperwork. It no. translated as you said, it's either unlimited usage or, you know, in a time period, region, all of that. So, you know, one piece that I always put into the mix when when you hear the term buyout is the actual image, and does that image have life? Right. And right. Because if we're shooting, you know, uh, a Coke bottle, that has life. That's going to be here long after we're all gone. But if you're shooting a computer, by the time you shoot it, there's a new one coming out. So you know, each one of these have, you know, a lifespan, and it's really figuring out how long that life is. You know, if it's a couple, you know, in, you know, wearing today's fashion, we know a year from now, two years from now, that image is worthless. They can't use it anymore because, of course, hair and styles all change. So I, I like to, I could, I could not agree more with both with what both of you have said. But for me, a piece of that is: is there a value to that image being bought out? You know, what, what, like yeah. you said, Lynn. Sometimes clients just say, "I want to buy out." You know, not you know, not thinking of the ramifications around that, how mm -hmm. sensitive it is to us. Yeah. But like I say, you know, I always I like to look at the image and say, listen, there's no value to this in a year. Let let's just you know, if they want a crazy number for a buyout, you know, we'll figure out what that is um, mm -hmm. because we all know they're not going to use that image two years right. down the road. That's very true. You know, cars get dated, products yeah. get dated fast. Like you said, fashion, eyewear, it gets dated and and. You know, that's just it. That's, if there is residual value to those images long term for that photographer, then we try to protect that. And that's really the ace in the hole. They're saying, they're screaming, buy out, buy out, buy out. And when we know there's no value to, you know, this, this product shot of Tide that's new and improved. Mm -hmm. They want to buy that out. <laughs> you can buy that out here. Take it. You know, because right. next month it's going to be new and improved yeah. and special Tide. Yeah, right. you won't be able to sell it for stock or relicense it. Well, and but that also comes into but that's evaluating too is your your usage fees. You know, right. exactly. in, in terms of unlimited usage, unlimited time, or a buyout, it doesn't mean that it's going to be necessarily hugely expensive. It depends on right. the content of the image, the the actual client. There's a lot of evaluating that goes into it. Yeah, um, so I agree. 
which leads uh, Lindsay to ask you the next question. Yeah, exactly, Frank. Thank you. So when it comes to photo um, usage, photo fees and usage fees, Lynn, um, do you usually, you know, you estimate them as one lump sum or separately? Kind of what's the protocol on that? Well, it does lead to that question as well. I, I generally, it, you know, we were talking about this earlier. You kind of go with your gut. But in general, for smaller clients or medium-sized clients, um, depending on their media buy, who they are, and kind of the outreach, if it's a national client or if it's more regional or targeted, um, I will usually try to, to lump the photo fee and the usage fee together. But I do find that there's, there's circumstances where it's preferable to go ahead and put them separately, and that would be if they, they purchase five images and we know there's potential to buy possibly ten, we might put as a, we might put the photo fee per day, and then the usage fee per image, um, and that'll keep that really clean. Yeah. Uh, you know, and and Stephanie too, you mentioned yesterday too. Is an, another option is when it's good to split up the um, the the photo fees and the usage fee. Is it is if it's a really big client, and they're coming in. You know, a blue chip company that's that we know has a wide you know, wide range of uh, a media buy, and they want to go ahead and purchase, you know, unlimited usage, unlimited time period. Well, and possibly all images. So we really need to show them how much that's going to be separate from the photo fee. Mm -hmm. And and once you show them that, it might bring, you know, the reality might set in. It's like, oh, you know what? Maybe we maybe these are going to date themselves after two years. Let's only buy two years. So mm -hmm. um, I think you know the benefit of having that that flexibility is you can use it for your benefit, mm -hmm. you know, lumping it in together. I think that the one thing is for um, in-house corporate clients, I do think that if you put this, the usage fee separately, I think it seems a little bit more daunting to them. Um, just because uh, there's a couple reasons I, f I find, you know, they do have a little bit uh, more difficult time tracking things as well. So it's um, to have it in one lump sum. I think it's just kind of easier for them to understand. And um, just to, to tell you the budget. And that just helps. to interject really quick, um, we have a few people that are in the Hangout that joined it um, on accident. So if those people are watching, if you can just please mute your microphones, you'll lose um, the other, other conversations that you're hearing. Sorry to interrupt you three. You guys can go back to uh, your conversation. Just wanted to uh, put that in there quick. With the breaking out of the usage fees versus working it into the creative fee, um, I was just saying that sometimes it helps when they actually tell you the budget. So you just say, okay, well, I'm going to protect that day rate, and I'm going to go ahead and say this per day includes usage, but I'm also going to charge for travel fee, if appropriate, tech scout prep day fee, if appropriate, etc. So that they do see one total creative fee, but yeah, there's different ways to work it, and sometimes the art producer, right? You guys, the art producer tells you exactly how they want it in their sheet. They want you to break it out, so or it's a conversation. It's not always set in stone. Yeah. Well, and I think sometimes the art buyers. I'm sorry, Frank. Sometimes the art buyers do know if there is a possibility that the usage might change, or if they're going to need additional usage down the road, so yeah. that. Want it broken out so that it gives them that base to work from. So then that's kind of your starting point for any other additional, you know, usage person purchased. The only thing I would add on to what you, you ladies have said, and I, and I agree with everything, is, is one point that you said, Lynn, about um, saying photo fee, you know, usage fee. And what I like to do sometimes is, okay. I, I, that was really the point, that you said that maybe they're going to shoot more images. What I like to do sometimes is put the photo fee, usage fee, and say this is for seven images. Right. And then if, they do, if your guy shoots more, then that's the upside for you guys, right? So you could say this is based on one to five images because they were, they're really not sure. A lot of times we'll do a job with a photojournalist who shoots a ton of film, yeah. a ton of images, and so now they have all these other images, and they say, wow, we really like this one. And now you look back on the estimate, and you said, you know, here the fee based on seven images, and this is the usage. So now they all of a sudden they want 12 yeah. images. That's, you know, that sort of becomes the sweet spot that, you know, you now are selling an extra five images, and now we can discuss that. And, you know, you're in the driver's seat because they already have the images, and they like them. 
Yeah. All right, so let's shift gears a little bit to budget. Um, so do you ask if they have a budget? And if so, when and how do you ask that question? Well, what I usually do, which almost goes back to our first question, um, you know, you're starting to have that conversation, and you're going through, we're going through the job now. And we're going to do this, we're shooting on location, or we're shooting in the studio, we need a stylist, we need this, we're going through it, wardrobe, this, or, you know, you're getting all the specs. And then I'll say to them, you know, do you have a sense of budget on this? Um, because now you've, you've worked through it, you know, very quickly in your head, and you, you've had that conversation with the art producer, and you're saying, okay, you know, I know we need this, and we need a Winnebago, and we need a Scout, and we need this. And then I'll say, you know, as you're sort of, you know, finishing up, do you guys have any idea, you know, budget-wise? And when you get that number, if you get a number, you then realize that they get it, or they don't. <laughs> you know, that, that really becomes the point, that, you know, we're, we're on location for three days, and we've got a scout, we've got four models, we're shooting, you know, outside, we're going to need a Winnebago, and somebody says, well, we're looking between twelve and $15,000. That's the moment where you say, we got to rethink this a little bit. The, 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 the reason why it can't be $12,000 is this. I'll try to, you know, I'm listening to you and I hear the number, but what I'll do is I'll put together an estimate. And that, that's really what you do. You put together an estimate, and maybe you do it quicker than you normally would, but you put together an estimate, and anyone looking at that estimate will say, where did we come up with $12,000? It's just not going to work, right? So you're then, you're then repositioning them as if to say, you guys really have to rethink this, or some, somebody has to go back to the client and tell them that that 12,000 number was just not right. And here's why. You know, you have talent, you have this, you have that. So, because sometimes w when, you, when you take that step back and you, another step back, you realize that somebody was in a creative meeting and they said, well, let's do these ads, and somebody said, well, how much is it going to cost? Well, probably twelve to $15,000 without having a clue on that. So, you know, on you know, what it's going to cost to do that. So that doesn't have to become, you know, the end all for you guys. It now becomes the job of the art producer and the account executive to explain to the client, here's why it can't be this number. It's got to be closer to this. And, and you show it. You know, once, once they see it on paper, they realize you're not ridiculous. Yeah. You know, you know, if you do the estimate and you come in at $12,000, you realize that everyone's going to be changing in their cars. And they're going to be eating Subway heroes. Unless you're shooting for Subway, that ain't going to work. Yeah. So the, the numbers prove you out um, as it relates to whether they have the budget or not. But I, I always, always ask the question. And you shouldn't feel uncomfortable asking because you're a professional. As a photographer, you're talking to this client. And, you, you know, a piece of this is creative, but a real big piece of this is that we're doing business. And business is, you know, you, you may feel a little bit uncomfortable with it, but if you got that number, even within a range, at least you have something to work with. And then from getting that number and doing your estimate, you realize these people got it. You know, and, and they may say 40, and your number may be 46. And you could look at it, oh, maybe I can noodle here, you know, tell me if your number is hard on 40, you know, after you do the estimate. But, but that becomes that, that, that connection you guys are having, because when, they, when that art producer sees the estimate and says, this all makes sense, I see it, you know, and, and you could say, you know, I'm willing to reduce my fee a little bit here, or I'll try this on usage, something, but the production is the production. And the last thing any, you know, art producer who's worth their weight in, in any way is going to say, I don't want my client, I don't want the agency to be vulnerable, where all of a sudden we don't have a place for the talent to change their clothes on a shoot on location. You can't have it. And they'll see that. Yeah. And they'll be getting probably two or three or four estimates from different photographers, and then they can cross-reference those numbers to see how true the numbers really are. The one thing that I do that's a little heavy-handed, but if, if it's a project that we really want and there's potential there, and if they give us a budget, let's say they want two days of shooting, but um, we really know that we could probably do one day of shooting 
and you know do certain situations and so I'll go ahead and estimate what the actual the actual creative is you know for the two days and then also provide them an estimate of here's what you can get for your budget you yeah know? and give them the opportunity to to see what direction they are but you have to feel out when it's you know beneficial to to go you know to go ahead and do provide them with two estimates and do the work exactly. But it all starts that conversation, like we, you know, we mentioned, and it's collaborating with them. Mm -hmm. Right. So, what about um, treatments? Is it important to provide a treatment? Um, For me, I, I, I always, I always do it. I always have the photographer do it, depending upon um, what's involved. And I think it's really, really important. I think, and I think more and more people are doing it. So, you know. Which means, what else can you do? But I think, you know, based on you know what the project is, you can really, you know, do some powerful, um, because powerful. Uh, what, what's the word? I'm you, you can really get to show and shed some skin in a in a two paragraph treatment. In that, you know, it's an unfiltered it's an unfiltered message directly to the art director, to the client on why and how I'm going to shoot this. And some projects, you know, lend themselves to be really dramatic. If you're working for a pharmaceutical company, and this is a particular product that helps this particular disease or ailment, and you could put something to paper around that on why it's important and why you want to shoot this job, that is, I mean, that's a home run. And everyone should be able to do that. So that, and and the, and the real sweet spot about that is that almost invariably, whatever you write. Somewhere internally, between the agency and the client, there was a moment that part of their research, one of the points that you make in your treatment is going to be from the, the analysis and research that they did internally. So you're going to be able to hit a home run here and there in that treatment if you really get your head around it. So treatments, I think, are really, really a great way to... Um, to, you know, to show them your passion around shooting that project. I think it's usually a, a appropriate now to do, and you know, more often than not, and then now it's becoming more expected as well. Yeah. But, you know, and you're showing your how you would approach the project. So, like you, you know, like you said, Frank is like sort of shedding your skin, and I think you know it is that aha moment when a creative. Um, sees that a photographer connects to their vision, you know, or even enhances their vision, and that's going to give you going to give you the edge. And uh, you know, and it's interesting too because directors have been doing treatments, you know, for you know, directors for advertising have been doing treatments for years. Yeah, they would never hire somebody without a treatment. Yeah. And I know it's a lot of work for everyone because it, it doesn't always, you know, come to fruition that you get the job. But I think too is, you know, I, I think too the more you do the treatments, the more um, I think the more thorough your estimate's going to be as well because you're really thinking through the project. So all in all, it, it's a good thing. And the more you do them, the you know, the easier they'll they'll kind of be produced. And it's a great opportunity to add visuals that you want them to see in case they missed it on your uh, website or your portfolio. It, you know, so it's really nice to put beautiful visuals with it to really tell the story. Yeah, I'll tell, do a very very quick story. We were bidding on a job five photographers, and it was for crystal meth prevention, and it's a pro bono job for an ad agency in San Francisco, and they gave us the number. Here's the number. It's fifty thousand dollars. So you know these five bids are going to come in at 50,000, 49, 51, whatever, you know, we're all going to be dead in, right? So I said to the photographer, um, Ron Haviv, I said, why don't you write a treatment? Great. So of course around crystal meth and what it does and how destructive it is to a family and a person and all that, you know, you could be very, very emotional. So he writes it and then, you know, you figure that at least one other person is going to do that as well. So we're going back and forth with the estimate and the treatment and this, this, and that. And the light bulb went off and said, you know what we should do? Let's put in the estimate for a drug consultant. Who better to speak about being on crystal meth than somebody who's in rehabilitation? Right? Because usually those drug consultants are former addicts. 
So I, I put it in the estimate, and we still came in just about $50,000. Five minutes later after I sent that estimate, the art buyer calls me and says, what's up with the, um, with the drug consultant? I said, you know, and I, I went through this. I almost had this woman crying. You know, who else is going to be able to direct that talent and the photographer around the curse of being on crystal meth and what it does and on and on and on. They called us back five minutes later, we got the job. And we got the job only because we, we outthought everybody else. Nobody else had put that in. So we do the shoot, shoot's over. Two days later, they call me up. Frank, who's the, um, who was that drug consultant? I need his name and I need his phone number. Sure, I'll get it for you. And of course, you have to ask why. Well, we're doing TV commercials and we want him on the shoot. The director of the TV commercials that, and that whole production company, nobody thought of having a drug consultant on the set. That director is the guy who directed Black Swan. Wow. So, I mean, the, the point of that long-winded story that I said was going to be short is how do you outthink everybody else? Because sometimes with this whole idea with the estimates, yeah. it's not about the numbers. Right. It's about something else. It's about connecting. And, you know, it, it was one of those rare moments in a, in a long career of doing estimates that it was just, it was an idea that got us that job. It was, and it was thrilling. And when they called me the next, you know, two days later, man, we were over the moon. It was really great. But anyway, I digress. That's very rewarding. That's amazing when that happens. It's true. You have to connect with them and think like they, what do they need to, to make this, really a great project so it came from a place of, of again solving the problem and doing it right and w when you look at it and you hear it what a simple idea yeah that you know we didn't come up with the cure for, for cancer or doing brain surgery that is the simplest idea in the world but you, you know but communicating with whether it's your studio manager or one of your assistants or your rep or your wife or husband and you keep on talking it through something's going to come and that's really the key Right, taking that time to evaluate it, and yeah. and I, it's got, yeah, it comes off that it's going to benefit them. But you know, too, is just like having somebody to thinking outside the box and providing that that insight. These are things you know that the client's not even thinking about. And it shows your passion for what you're doing as a photographer. Why are you in the game? Like, where's the skin in the game? And yeah. You know, what are you going to bring to the table? And if you're really thinking and excited about the project, you're going to come up with great ideas, especially like Frank said, if you brainstorm with people and you really look at the campaign, you're really excited about it genuinely, you know, and that's how you ought to be to be bidding on something anyway. Yeah. Make it happen. Okay, so this question kind of goes to all three of you. Um, when is it a good time to walk away from a project? I think it's just when, a lot of times too, when it just becomes, the, the timeline starts getting, uh, it's just logistically impossible to, to pull off the shoot. I mean, sometimes you'll even be, you know, waiting to be awarded a project, and there'll be certain situations that you're waiting for the approval, you've got everything, you've got your crew on hold, and um, you're just not getting that client approval, so you have to just eventually give them a date and say, you know, as of Friday, if we don't have approval, we're not going to be able to deliver, you know, and shoot when you want to do it. So I think that, you know, that happens. And then, too, when it starts to, when they start tightening the budget and financially, it just, in your gut, you know, it's it's just too much. You just got to walk away from it. Yeah. You got to know your bottom line. Yeah. Yeah, I think, Lynn, Lynn, you hit it right on the head. You know when you're getting that sickening feeling in your gut, Man, we got to get out of this one. You know, yeah. it doesn't happen often, but th there are those times. And, and you know, th the other piece of it is your, you know, you're talking to the art producer, and they're feeling the same anguish because they're just waiting for the phone call from the client, right? You know, they're waiting for the account executive to be talking to the client. You got to go ahead. You got to go ahead. So they're feeling the same pain that you are. It's, you know, and, and you know, it's it's intriguing to me how sometimes you get into those situations. By no fault of your own, you're in the middle of this stinking mess that you didn't create, and here you are. 
And now you've got to be sort of the grown-up to say, listen, how do you expect us to do this? Right. We've got to build the set or we've got to find locations and you want to shoot on Wednesday. It's Friday afternoon. Right. Right? I mean, or, or you're not allowed. You know what I, so, but, you know, sometimes what I'll do is, um, uh, you know, you're, you're thinking about walking away and, you know, what I, tr what I try to do sometimes is to engage them in some way. You know what? Why don't you at least approve the money, the casting? So sure. that we, we could at least, at least be doing something, it, and it makes them commit on some level that, you know, we're moving along here. You know, and, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But yeah. you know, it, it shows commitment. It shows, that you, it, it shows that you are thinking that at least if we can get the casting and the scouting done, we at least have that. And if they kill the job, you're just in for that money. Yep. You know, that, that's, that's a way around that, too. That's a good solution. And, you know, from the get-go, like when you walk away from the get-go and they're asking you to bid on something, well, if you've asked all the right questions and they're really firm on their budget and it's just not doable, and then you're bidding with five people, or you, there's just, you know, you just have to evaluate the whole thing and really feel it out. And But if they're respectful and they love your work and they're, it's a dialogue, then it's a great opportunity to make that connection and try your best. But there are times when you just have to say, you know, here's our estimate. I'm sorry it's over where you need us to be, but this is what it would, would cost. And, of course, we're flexible, but this is the best we can do um, for production anyway. And then the fees were flexible, but really the production is what it is unless you can cut some shots. And you know, So it just gets to that point. And the other thing is if you don't have an advance on time before shooting, that's another serious, serious situation where you may have to say, look, um, we have to have that advance on set, you know, it's next week or what have you, and we may have to, some, I have had to do that in my experience. I've had to uh, put some shoots on hold until the advance came through. It was terrible, but. Yeah, Stephanie, would you ever say to somebody, like, so you're in that situation, I'm going to play Lindsay for a second. You're, <laughs> you're in that situation where you, know, you just can't do it, because I've said this to, to other people, where, where you say to them, and I would really be wary of anyone who could do it, or who says they can do it. Right. Oh yeah. I've done that. I said, you know, yeah, you can. Someone's going to tell you they're going to do this for ten, you know, whatever the number is, and I and I said I would really be suspicious, or you're going to get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've said that based on, you know, if I really don't know this person and they're really coming from, you know, from out of nowhere, you know, it's almost like. You know what? Go and do that, but be wary. You know, it's like you, you're not playing the role of the grown-up, but you know, you're sort of repositioning them so that they have a little bit of doubt. Now, how is someone going to really do that? Good luck to you, Akanahara, but you know, like, can it really be done? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's that dialogue where they they also realize the risk they're putting themselves and their client in if it's right. not going to be produced properly. Yeah, and you don't want to risk your career or your, you know, um, relationship with them. And if you do go ahead and move on, and you don't have the finances to do the production correctly, and it's a disaster, and you know, and it's, you know, it's a it's a small world. People also, you know, news travels too. If you if you fail at a shoot, so you've got to just kind of go with your gut and pull the plug when you you know feel uncomfortable about it. But let me ask you, I'll play Lindsay again. So as consultants, as all of us, <laughs> how, does that, how does that really work when you have to go back to the photographer and say, I think you should, and the photographer is biting at the, you know, the, the bit there, I really want this job, this is great, you know, I, I, I need the job, right? I mean, it's all those realities. How do you, you know, how do you work, you know, how do you work that when you have to say to, you know, to John, John, you know what, we got to walk away from this and let me tell you why. And you know they're they're coming from a standpoint. I know I can do it. I know I can do it. You know how do you, how do you wash that? You can yeah. answer that, Lindsay. And I I've, I've had that though too. Is where I just I, I totally you know tell them that it's it's just not going to be doable, and that he's going to have you know a situation on his hands. So and and I think what happens too is I think as the more that maybe a greener photographer does these types of jobs and goes ahead and pushes the limits and does them, I think then afterwards they won't do it again. You know, mm -hmm. there is a learning curve because after you're all of a sudden because you've cut, you know, cut your location scout and you cut your casting person 
and you're all running around doing all of these, you know, sort of duties of others, um, at a, you know, the next time around they're not going to want to do it. So there is a little bit of a learning curve too. A burnout. I've, I've had that learning curve. So. <laughs> I mean, it's not to say that. In today's world, with the Instagram campaigns and the budgets that we deal, we all see, it's not to say that we don't all do our best to say, hey, let's put on a show. Let's, what can you guys provide? Oh, you have real employees we can shoot, and okay, well they'll bring their own clothes. Okay, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll let you guys handle that casting element, or you know, how can we work together on this estimate, on this production approach, so that we can make it work for your budget? Is always where we try our best, but sometimes you just, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so what's the best advice that you three can give a photographer who's, you know, navigating their way through the maze of estimating? Who wants to take that first? I can take it. Um, you know, basically, I think it's so important because um, is to maybe just take a breath once you know we all get our adrenaline goes when it when that phone call start you know rings and they want an estimate the same day I think you know my biggest advice is if you can you know respecting the the client's timeline if you can extend extend the deadline for the estimate to be the next day it will um, give you time to really thoroughly think through the project do a treatment um, you know, things come up. You could you could put together an estimate, and then the next thing you know, you know, um, you're starting to reevaluate the fees or or take a look, and maybe you forgot the motorhome. I mean, things just sort of evolve as you're you're running through um, the shoot itself in your head. So take a, I think kind of take a you know take a breath, and um, and also to make sure that you have all the details as well. Don't just be so. Um, you know, just reacting, but okay. obviously respectful. Right. Like Frank said earlier, it shows professionalism uh, and collaborative, you know, good spirit to really ask all those right questions like, you know, where are we shooting and what's the timeline, where, you know, all the details under the sun and take your time with it because you may want to give them more than one option and if you just race and rush right into a burning building, which I was told early on in my career, it's not a good thing. Right. You know, in thinking about the answer to that question, when you look back on, on this 45 minutes, 50 minutes, we never really discuss numbers. And that's really the key. Estimating process is not about numbers. Because numbers generally are going to fall out a little bit high here, a little bit low there, and the numbers are going to be the same. For me, the most important thing is about connecting with, with a client on every level whether you get this job or not for some reason they contacted you that's a win and how do you keep on winning even if you don't get this project it's because you're connected with them yeah I mean, even that story I told about you know the drug consultant that ad agency was in San Francisco they could have taken my idea and and shot with their local guy in San Francisco because they had somebody bidding from there so it's it's about thinking. It's about collaborating. Certainly, you know what we've said throughout this entire 50 minutes. It's about how do you connect with with, with these potential clients in a way that really you know made you get involved in their piece of business. Whether it's researching their websites before you get on this before you get on the calls, um, or just being fair in your pricing. But don't get lost in the numbers. The, I, I never believe that the numbers are why you win or lose projects. I think you, 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 if you've ever got a job and they called you back because you know what, Michael, we really want to use you but your numbers are higher, that means you connected. That means you did something right. You just need to noodle your numbers a little bit to make it right for their budget. But that's when you know you really did your job. When you don't get a call back and you submitted an estimate, nothing was built. Yeah. That's and I'd like to add really quick on that note, it's the connecting thing like Frank said, it's, it's that because they want to hear you, they want to know who you are, what you're going to be like to work with. We didn't talk much about the creative call, but the creative call is crucial. And I personally don't like to do estimates for photographers uh, without them meeting the photographer. 
um, and talking it through with the art director and, and uh, making that connection on that call. It's super important to show your enthusiasm for the project, you know, and be free and open with your ideas. Don't be paranoid about sharing what you're going to bring to the table. They want to hear you and, and also see your work. They want to put your best foot forward, the best edit you can in that treatment visually. And yeah, it's really important. You have to be your creative self and show enthusiasm, you know. That's yeah. so important, too. I mean, because it's taken a while for this to, to get to, you know, the, the bidding stage. You know, this is the, these jobs have had a life prior to when they get to you. So, you know, they're excited to have this, this shoot possibility, you know, the creative. So you want to be excited about it. And, and something that Stephanie said about the creative core, which is key, yeah. They're really interviewing you because they're going to have to spend a week with you, four days. They want to know that you get the project for sure, but they want to have a good time. They're getting finally out of the office to, to, um, to Lynn's point, and they're doing the shoot. They want to be around somebody that's a lot of fun, very professional, and they're going to have a good time. You know, so yeah. that has to be conveyed in that, conf in that creative call, like Stephanie said, so that when, they, when you're off that call, say, wow, working with Lynn is going to be so much fun. Yeah. Right? And, she, you know, of course, they've almost taken for granted that they're going to get the imagery that they want. That's fine. And they're going to get it on the budget, they said. That's fine. But now, I want to have a good time. I'm going to be, yeah. you know, in the middle of Montana for four days. I better have a good time. Right. You know, yeah, that, have, fun. That, have fun with the call. Talk about the food. Talk about right. Absolutely. You know things to do around the area where you're shooting. Be uh, be knowledgeable about that. And sometimes I've had the producers on the calls too to help support the location issues right. and to really talk to things that maybe the photographer doesn't know as much about Montana. You know. Yep. Okay, great. So to round us out, I'm actually going to take a question from one of our viewers, and I apologize if I pronounce your last name wrong. Um, but Richard Rodemauer. Um, submitted a question and he wants to know is there a form of estimating that is used more than others and if so what would that be? Like Blinkbid is a good estimating format online? Yeah I you know and I actually you can you can customize your own with an Excel document and, and I think we've all done that for years and years um, and so I sort of you get used to something, but I did. I actually moved over to Blinkfit, and I, I totally, I love it. So um, I think it is good to to find a software and and kind of stick with it too. It makes your whole estimating process much quicker as well. The more you know the ins and outs of it. But I like Blinkfit. What do you use, Frank? I, I do. I do what you said. I mean, sometimes Blinkfit, but I like the Excel sheet too. Yeah. You know where. You know, I could really customize it for that particular shoot. Um, so, so that works for us as well. You know, yeah. I think w whatever anyone's comfortable with, as long as the person who gets it can look at it and say, okay, okay, I get, you know, it's not too cumbersome or it's not all over the place or there's too many categories that aren't applicable to the project. Yeah, yeah. You, know, yeah. You, need, you know, I'm all about that. Yeah, it's got to be clear. The terms and conditions need to be there. You need to be comfortable with the terms and conditions, and, and it does help protect you. Your caveats are very important in your job description. Um, everything needs to be, you know, very clear, but not too long-winded, but very clear, spelling out what you're shooting in your job description and, and any kind of bullet points and caveats, things that are not, we are still unknowns, and, you know, and then the terms and conditions you can get on, what, ASMP website or... Other standard business, maybe Blinkbid provides some basic ones, but don't just do boiler point. Uh, try to try to make them appropriate for that job. Right. Great. Okay. Well, first off, I want to thank um, Lynn, Frank, and Stephanie for joining us today, and um, you know, giving us all their knowledge and expertise on estimating. Um, and of course, we want to apologize. Um, for the mix-up with the Google Hangout in the beginning of this, and we appreciate anyone that went to the YouTube channel to tune in. Um, we're going to be sending out an email after this with a link to the full broadcast so you can see anything that you missed in the beginning. Um, we appreciate your patience with us today, and um, we hope you still enjoyed the Hangout and we provided you with some really good content and um, an enjoyable lunch hour on your Friday. So again, thanks so much for joining us, and um, have a great weekend.
Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Thanks, Thanks Lindsay. everybody. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>